Greetings and welcome to K-12 Fourth Quarter Fiscal 2020 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn this conference over to your host, Mr. Mike Kraft, Head of Investor Relations. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you and good afternoon. Welcome to K-12's fourth quarter and year-end earnings conference call for fiscal year 2020. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that in addition to historical information, certain comments made during this conference call may be considered forward-looking statements. These statements are made pursuant to the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. They should be considered in conjunction with cautionary statements contained in our earnings release and the company's periodic filings with the SEC. Forward-looking statements involve risks and uncertainties that may cause actual performance or results to differ materially from those expressed or implied by such statements. In addition, this conference call contains time-sensitive information that reflects management's best analysis only as of the day of this live call. K-12 does not undertake any obligation to publicly update or revise any forward-looking statements. For further information concerning risks and uncertainties that could materially affect financial and operational performance and results, please refer to our reports filed with the SEC. The, the, <clears throat> excuse me, these reports include, without limitation, cautionary statements made in K-12's 2020 annual reform report on Form 10-K, <clears throat> these filings can be found on the Investor Relations section of our website at www.k12.com. In addition to disclosing financial results in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles in the U.S. or GAAP, we will discuss certain information that is considered non-GAAP financial information. A reconciliation of this non-GAAP financial information to the most closely comparable gap information was included in our earnings release and is also posted on our website. This call is open to the public and is being webcast. The call will be available for replay for 30 days. With me on today's call is Nate Davis, Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Board, and Tim Medina, Chief Financial Officer. Following our prepared remarks, we will answer any questions you may have. I'd like to now turn the call over to Nate. Nate? Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining us on the call today. It's year end, so my comments will be a little longer than normal, but I wanted to give you a complete picture of the year in review and the direction we're headed. First, on behalf of my entire team here at K-12, I'd like to begin by extending my thoughts and prayers to those of you who are suffering and have experienced loss because of the coronavirus pandemic. Throughout my talk today, I'll cover where our business has been hurt by the pandemic and also how it's drawn more customers to our technology and services. So let's get started. I'm pleased to report that K-12 ended fiscal year 2020 with a strong financial performance. For both the quarter and the year, we met or beat our guidance across the board for revenue, adjusted operating income, and capital expenditures. As most of you know, we are now seeing increased interest from online school options across the nation and we expect to see even stronger trends as we enter FY21. Our fiscal year 2020 revenue was 1,040,800 million. Keep in mind that those revenues were largely by enrollment, driven by enrollment trends before the pandemic hit. That's because due to state laws and policies by authorizers and local school boards, many K-12 powered schools were restricted from taking new enrollments late in the school year, just as the pandemic hit the country. Therefore, the fiscal 20 impact on our revenues was very small. However, we do anticipate a more significant revenue growth in FY21, which I will discuss in a few moments. Turning to profitability, adjusted operating income for the year was 56.1 million. Excluding the impact of galvanized acquisition, adjusted operating income would have been 74.1 million, an increase of more than 19% year over year. It's worth noting that the 74.1 million would have beat our original guidance for the full year of 68 to 72 million. This shows the strength and predictability of our core business. 
Our adjusted operating income growth was driven both by revenue growth as well as by ongoing focus on cost reduction and operating efficiency. I also want to note that capital expenditures for the year came in at a lower than lower end of our guidance range. As we do every year, our investments focus on improving the user experience, enhancing teacher tools, and strengthening student engagement. Some key investments include a new mobile learning management system for the kindergarten to fifth grade learners, an adaptive algorithm that gauges and adjust the student's reading level and matches them to appropriate text, and new courses for our career pathway. Importantly, we also migrated most customer-facing applications to Amazon Web Services or AWS. This change in particular supports our efforts to scale our business in a more cost-effective way as we ramp up enrollment and expand our business in the coming years. And finally, we ended the year with a strong liquidity position. Our cash Cash equivalent and restricted cash was $213.3 million at year end. Now, this balance includes both the drawdown of $100 million of, on, of our revolving credit facility and the use of $165 million for the purchase of Galvanize. So, we enter fiscal year 21 with our revenue and adjusted operating income increasing, the capacity across our business to support high, in, high enrollment growth, a career learning business reaching even more of the addressable market and funding for our long-term growth initiative. As I noted a minute ago, our results underscore the strength of the core of our business and the continued demand for blended and online learning options. More than 100,000 students in K-12 powered schools completed this school year on schedule and with little, little interruption. We saw over 8,000 new students graduate from high school this year, bringing the total number of students who graduated from a K-12 powered high school to more than 50,000. Importantly, we ended the year with student retention rates at our highest level ever. Over the past three years, we've improved student retention by 550 basis points. Now, to put that in perspective, improved retention equates to more than 100 million in revenue that would have been lost over this three-year period. It also had the effect of lowering marketing costs for enrollment. Our entire team is really proud of these numbers. But I have to tell you, our team also knows we have to continue to improve and we have to deliver great service. That's especially important to the larger than ever number of new students coming into our program this coming year. The pandemic has driven more parents and families to explore online learning options, more school districts to use online learning, and more policymakers to understand the value of an online learning option in their state. Starting with consumers. A recent poll conducted by Morning Consult showed that 71% of parents felt that online education should be an ongoing option for students, even after the pandemic subsided. As for school districts, more and more of them now plan to use online learning as an alternative to in-person -cla in classes. One such school district is Miami-Dade County Public School, a district we've had a relationship for more than a decade. With Superintendent Carvalho and his staff's guidance, K-12 will provide customized services, including curriculum, assessment tools, teacher training, and data management. This will ensure a strong start to the new year for both educators and Miami-Dade's more than 270,000 students that will serve. The teachers already employed by Miami-Dade will combine their great teaching with our technology and expertise to provide high quality instruction in a safe environment. This allows Miami-Dade to retain both teacher jobs and the all-important existing student-teacher relationship. In alignment with, it, with um, their existing learning goals, Miami-Dade public school teachers and administrators can also customize the online curriculum we're providing, including core subjects and hundreds of electives. This shows the flexibility of the K-12 technical platform. We're thrilled to support Superintendent Cavallo and the innovative solution he and his team have designed. This is just one example of how a large school district can rise to meet the unprecedented challenges of school closures caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. We're working with other school districts on their own customized solutions for the fall as well. And we stand ready to support schools and school districts of any size during this critical time. <clears throat> this quarter, we also continue to make our products available for free on a trial basis. 
To date, more than 200,000 families, teachers, students, and schools have signed up for these programs and webinars. This is more than twice the number who took advantage of it last quarter. We believe this outreach, the public discussion around online schooling, our own marketing efforts, have all increased the number of families who are looking at enrolling their students in our schools this fall. In the fourth quarter of our fiscal year, we saw lead volumes and enrollment applications rising more than 50% compared to the same period last year. Now we caution that it's still too early to know how many of the applications will result in final school enrollment for the 2021 school year. With many parents still finalizing their students' plans, we can't be sure of how much of this interest will translate into a final enrollment. That being said, we believe that many of the families who have begun the enrollment process will complete the enrollment process for the fall. And a little later, I'm going to give you even more quantitative understanding of our current enrollment status. With the potential for significant increases in enrollment, we're taking steps to prepare for the upcoming school year. This includes proactively hiring 1,300 incremental teachers and education staff members, building education additional server capacity, buying thousands of new student computers, and stocking offline materials so that they're ready to go when students enroll. And most importantly, we're focused on ensuring families have an outstanding academic experience when they enroll in the K-12 Power Program, with Early Start programs, welcoming programs, and other ways of, of reaching their teachers and their, their administrators. Now I'd like to turn to our career learning offer. This year, we hit a significant milestone. We ended the year with revenues of $107 million inclusive of Gallatin. This is an increase of 115% year over year. In a little more than three years, We've built a comprehensive and innovative approach to career learning that serves more than 13,000 students this past year and posted more than 100 million in revenue. We believe that career learning increases our addressable market by more than tenfold and will be a driver for revenue growth and profitability in, in years to come. Our nation has approximately 15 million high school students. Our market show surveys show that over 12% of these students will consider full-time online public schools and their parents also concur that they would consider full-time online public schools. And it's the schools that combine traditional core academics, such as math and English, with online career readiness education. And other statistics reinforce our belief in the long-term growth potential for this system. For example, research conducted by Burning Glass Technology over the last 90 days shows that 56% of job openings required less than a four-year college degree. Our career learning program for both second, <clears throat> secondary students and adults closely aligns with this market demand in today's tech-first job market. So a quick commentary on some of their accomplishments in this area over the last 12 months. First, we opened Destination of Career Academies, or DCAs as you might hear me say, in New Mexico, Kansas, Missouri, and Wyoming. And it brings the total number of DCAs to 24 for the start of this school year. Additionally, we expanded programs into middle school grades in seven schools, allowing students to get a jump start on career exploration and what career learning is all about. In total, more than 9 million students across the nation now have access to our career learning options. Over the next two to three years, we plan on expanding our coverage across all of the states that we serve public schools in. Secondly, we enrolled 16 new project-based, I'm sorry, we rolled out 16 new project-based learning courses in subjects like entrepreneurship, marketing, healthcare, and computer literacy, just to name a few. This learning approach keeps students more engaged and makes classes more collaborative. We're also seeing a link between increased DCA student engagement and retention. At the end of the year, Student retention in DCA programs was nearly 10% better than in their non-DCA counterparts. And while there are many factors that contributed to this change, this kind of change is significant. For some time, we speculated that DCA experience has helped to further engage and retain students at a higher rate, and we're now seeing the results of our efforts. Third, an important part of the career learning program involves opportunities for students to explore careers, exposure to industry experts. 
This includes chat delivered on the Netflix virtual platform. This opportunity complements real-world work experiences in the form of job shadowing and internships. In fact, K-12's annual Job Shadow Week, which was only in its second year, had over 2,500 student participants this year, and that's up from just a few hundred last year. Companies like Google, Salesforce, Google's subsidiary YouTube, the Motion Picture Association of America, all connected with students from across the country, exposing them to the professional skills and expertise they'll need to succeed. Fourth, our career learning career networking partner, Talo. They reached a significant milestone as they surpassed 1 million talent users on their platform. That's almost double the number of users the platform compared to a year ago. This quarter, Talo also saw colleges and universities turn to them as an alternative to the in-person recruiting initiative that got canceled because of COVID. Talo is now serving new partners ranging from Texas Tech University and the Medical University of South Carolina to smaller specialized schools like the College of Creative Services and Creative Studies in Detroit. However, the Talib proposition is it's just more than just adding students and partners. It's about how these constituencies are leveraging the platform. During the past year, Talib made more than 180 direct engagements, what we call matches, between institutions seeking students for scholarships or jobs to Talib members who are looking for those scholarships and jobs. Again, this is just the beginning. In the future, I see even more growth opportunities and new applications for the platform as part of our career learning experience. And finally, a, a valuable new part of our career learning business is Galvanize. Market demand for software engineers and data scientists continues even during the pandemic. In the same burning glass technologies research I mentioned earlier, more than 27% of recent job openings across a diverse set of industries are IT related. The immersive boot camp from Galvanize continues to be 100% live, but it's now online rather than in building. And while students have selected to defer, some students have selected to defer their admissions until in building classes have resumed, the focus on remote learning has expanded our potential student population. One example is the recently announced part time data science program, which is available nationwide. This online program provides the same curriculum, program structure, and quality as Galvanize's full-time program, but over a 30-week time frame instead of an intensive 12-week full-time program. Our hope is that working parents, veterans, and anyone who wants to keep their current job and keep their current earnings while they're going on with their learning can take advantage of this program. On the enterprise side of Galvanize's business, We've seen corporate opportunities slow down. As corporations, if workers working from home and they're not willing to spend as much money in these tight and footed times. So in this market, the enterprise market has slowed and will remain that way until concerns about COVID-19 subside. But even during the market stall during, due to COVID, we've had recent wins, large wins. For instance, USAA, T-Mobile, and Ally Financial have hired Galvanized to upskill portions of their IT talent base. <clears throat> In addition, Galvanize has not limited its enterprise efforts to the U.S. This quarter, Galvanize team addressed interest from companies in Germany, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and India. And as the economy begins to recover, we believe we'll continue to see increased interest from enterprises across the globe. As you might imagine, the community business is the other part of Galvanize's business that has been slowed by, by COVID. As we've said before, publicly, the community business will not deliver on expectations in the short term. Due to COVID-19 mandated restrictions, general worker concerns, many workers simply will not be back in physical offices at the numbers they used to, and that's to be expected. However, we believe that Galvanize's immersive boot camps for consumers can and will continue to deliver strong growth and we're confident in Galvanize's business prospects over the long term. Now, before I leave my discussion on Galvanize, I want to briefly mention one other milestone. For the spring semester, we plan to roll out our first high school course based on Galvanize's content. In just six months after the acquisition, we completed the course design. This is a core synergy from this acquisition. A key differentiator for our career learning business is to be able to use Galvanize content at the high school level 
we're planning to create additional courses at the high school level using the galvanized personnel and galvanized expertise. As I've outlined today, we're building on a strong year, and we're looking even stronger growth next year and over the long term. The early indicators for FY21 are all positive. Enrollment growth is increasing, and we're seeing increased interest in K-12 solutions. But I want to be clear here. Our managed public schools have already enrolled 150,000 students as of last week. That's a 23% increase so far from the 122,000 enrollments we posted the first quarter of fiscal 20. Traditionally, the final weeks of the enrollment season drive even more enrollment. With about eight weeks remaining in this year's enrollment season, we expect to be fairly busy. Now, it's still unclear when the pandemic will subside. It's unclear what student retention rates will be. It's unclear what the effect of state budget allocations for education might have on pupil reimbursement rates. But even with all these unknowns, we believe we are positioned and well positioned to deliver percentage growth well into the double digits in both revenue and adjusted operating income in fiscal 21. Keep in mind, this is only in statement of enrollment growth so far to date as of last week and not formal guidance for the coming year. As we do every year, we will provide formal guidance for the fiscal year in late October when we announce first quarter earnings. Okay, I'm getting close to closing. I warned you this was gonna be long because it's the end of the year and there's a lot to say. Wrap it up, we've always maintained distance learning technology is a key to the way education will be delivered in the future. It happened at the corporate level. It happened at the college level. And it's at the grade school level as well. Our company is clearly no longer just a kindergarten to 12th grade general education platform provider. We're positioned to be a leader and an innovator in this space across different age groups and different applications. We're in the right market at the right time with the right experience and technology to take advantage of a large addressable market. There is increased awareness and acceptance of online and blended options. School districts are embracing online learning. Many districts now understand the need for blended and distance learning technical platforms and are out buying them, not only for their short-term needs, but on an ongoing basis. And corporations are partnering with us, not only to hire these students, but to use our services to upskill and reskill their software engineering and data science departments. It all bodes well for us in fiscal 21, but also for the long-term future as well. We're successfully transitioning this company from an education platform to an education platform that drives lifelong learning. Let me end my comments by briefly mentioning the role we play as educators in this turbulent time that surrounds systemic racism and blatant disregard for the welfare of some minorities, particularly black people in parts of our country. We have a role to play. And I hope you saw our announcement around social and environmental responsibility. Our board, our management team, and all of our employees represent the kind of diversity that I think all companies should display. We announced even more scholarships, law enforcement pathways, a national forum on educational equal access, a commitment to more diversity in our teacher ranks. We've dedicated employee teams to each of these initiatives and given them time off to pursue these community activities. Please take a look at our website for more information about our commitment in this area. We so strongly believe it's important that everybody in our organization is committed to racial equality. Everyone, Thank you again for your time today. Now I'll hand the call over to Tim. He will elaborate on fourth quarter and full year financial results. Tim? Thank you, Nate, and good afternoon, everyone. As you can see from our results, we had strong financial performance in fiscal 2020. We exited the year with great momentum leading into fiscal 2021, and we were well positioned for higher growth. In addition to reviewing our fourth quarter and full fiscal year results, I also want to provide some commentary on fiscal 2021 trends and discuss changes we'll be making to our fiscal 21 reporting. First, to recap our reported results. Revenue for the quarter was $268.9 million, an increase of 4.9% from the prior year. For the full year, revenue was $1 billion and $40.8 million, an increase of 2.5% from fiscal year 2019. For the quarter, 
Income from operations was $7 million, an increase of $4.3 million from the prior year. For the full year, income from operations was $32.5 million, down $13 million compared to fiscal year 2019. Adjusted operating income was $12.9 million for the quarter, an increase of $5.7 million from the prior year. For the full year, adjusted operating income was $56.1 million, a decrease of $6.1 million from fiscal 2019. Capital expenditures for the year were $45 million, a decrease of $3.4 million from the prior year. As Nate mentioned, in each case, our results met or beat the expectations we provided in our guidance. In fact, we met or beat guidance every quarter this year, as well as for the full year. And that holds whether you include or exclude the impact of the galvanized acquisition. Now some additional details for the fourth quarter and the full year. The $25 million increase in revenue for the year was driven by the strength of our core managed public school business and our acquisition of Galvanize. This was somewhat offset by declines in our non-managed public school business. In managed public school programs, revenue for the year increased $29.8 million, or 3.3%, to $920.1 million. This growth was driven by increased enrollment and improved student retention. Revenue per enrollment for these programs grew to $7,758 for the year. This is in line with our historical average of 0 to 2% growth in revenue per enrollment. Given the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on state budgets, we could see some negative impacts to revenue per enrollment in fiscal 2021. We are monitoring the ongoing state budget discussions and will have a more complete picture for our first quarter earnings. With the increased enrollment we are seeing, we believe that volume gains will far outpace any potential downward pressure on our revenue per employment. For the fourth quarter, revenue and managed public school programs increased $10.3 million to $234.6 million. In addition to enrollment trends and stronger than expected student retention, this increase was driven by, was partly driven by revenue we recognized related to services provided in prior periods of fiscal 2020. We recognized this revenue following the resolution of claims with Georgia Cyber Academy. Moving to our institutional business, which includes both non-managed public school programs and institutional software and services, revenue for the year declined 16.7% from the prior year. This was in line with the expectations we outlined at the beginning of the year. Non-managed public school program revenue declined 28.5% for the year, largely due to the contract terminations we have pre previously discussed. Institutional software and services revenue were down 1.4% for the year. As Nate mentioned, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen an increase in schools and districts reaching out to K-12 to provide online options for students and families. While some contracts are signed, some conversations are still ongoing, and it is still too early to know the impact on this business. However, we believe that this business will grow in fiscal 2021 after several years of declining revenue. Private pay revenue was 16.4 million for the quarter and 45.7 million for the year. The galvanized acquisition added 11 million in revenue to this business since the acquisition. The galvanized revenue is somewhat reduced by the impact of purchase price accounting. Excluding those impacts, galvanized revenue for fiscal 2020 uh, since our acquisition would have been $13.6 million. Gross margins for the year were 33.4%, 130 basis points lower than the prior year. Margins were impacted by galvanize, as well as lower institutional sales. It is worth noting that excluding the impact of the galvanized acquisition, gross margins would have been 34.5%. Over the long term, we look for improving gross margins as our business mix shifts toward higher margin revenues and funding levels for public school programs continue to rise. 
for the year, selling general and administrative expenses were $315.1 million. Excluding the galvanized acquisition, these expenses were $304.2 million, a decrease of 0.8% from the prior year. We continue to focus on driving a more efficient organization through increased automation and process improvements while maintaining our investments in growth areas like career readiness. For the year, adjusted EBITDA was $128.2 million. Excluding the impact of the galvanized acquisition, adjusted EBITDA was $142 million, an increase of 6.3% from the prior year. This improvement was driven by our growth and focus on cost efficiencies. Adjusted operating income was $56.1 million. Excluding the galvanized acquisition, adjusted operating income for the year was $74.1 million, an increase of $11.9 million, or 19.1% from the prior year. Our improvements in profitability underscore the strength of our managed public school business and effective management of our cost structure. Stock-based compensation for fiscal year 20 totaled $23.6 million. A few years ago, we implemented a long-term incentive based on growth in our career learning solutions business. In fiscal 21, more information about the likelihood of achieving some of the targets in that plan may be available. Therefore, we could begin to record the expense and see an increase in stock-based compensation in fiscal year 21. Some other items to note. We ended the year with cash and cash equivalents of $213.3 million, a decrease of $71.3 million from the prior year. Then this increase was driven by our acquisition of Galvanize, partly offset by the draw against our credit facility. During last quarter's earnings call, I mentioned that we saw strong enrollment growth in states that typically pay all public schools after the school year. This resulted in lower free cash flow for fiscal year 2020. However, based on the shift in these payments and the early indicators in July and August, we expect to see substantially stronger cash flow in fiscal year 2021. Turning to capital expenditures, CapEx, which includes curriculum and software development and infrastructure, was $45 million, a decrease of $3.4 million compared to last year. Over the past couple of years, we've maintained CapEx in this range of $45 million to $50 million a year. Going forward, we believe this level of capital outlay is sufficient to support our core business, as well as the growth and career learning inclusive of the galvanized acquisition. Our effective tax rate for the year was 25.8%. We had some positive tax benefits related to prior year returns in fiscal 2020 that will not recur in fiscal 2021. Additionally, we expect to see an increase in non-deductible compensation. Therefore, expect that for next year, or this year, fiscal 21, our tax rate will be closer to 30%. Now, I want to outline some changes we'll be making in our reporting for fiscal year 2021. First, we're going to update the way we report lines of revenue. Over the past few years, our business has evolved, as you heard Nate explain. Where we used to be a company focused on one market, general education, we have since added a second, career learning. In just a few short years, career learning has already topped $100 million in revenues and is the fastest growing portion of our business. To reflect this evolution, our reporting will shift from a product focus, such as managed schools, institutional, etc., to a market focus, general education and career learning. We believe this new reporting will provide investors with better insight into our operations and clarity into the key drivers of growth. Second, we have been evaluating ways to better highlight our underlying business performance, especially our profitability metrics. We also want to make changes that will better align our results to how other similar companies are reporting. This issue has become more apparent with the acquisition of Galvanize and will be magnified if we make additional acquisitions. To that end, we will be updating our definition of adjusted operating income 
which presently excludes stock-based compensation, to also exclude amortization of intangible assets. We believe this will allow investors to better understand our operating and financial performance without the impact of these non-cash charges. Look for more details on both the new lines of reporting and the changes to our adjusted operating income calculations in our first quarter results report. We will provide the necessary information to allow investors to bridge from the old to the new reporting. Overall, we are very pleased with our performance this year. We saw our fourth straight year of revenue growth. We were able to continue to make investments to improve the academic outcomes for the students we serve, while also growing our core and career learning businesses. We also acquired Galvanize to expand our career learning offerings into the adult and corporate training markets and to enrich our, our high school IT career pathways with Galvanize content. Our core business and our growing career learning business put us in a strong position going into fiscal 2021. We are making investments now to ensure that we can serve all the families who choose to attend a K-12 powered school. We believe these early indications show we are on track for strong revenue and profitability growth in fiscal 2021. Additionally, we continue to have a strong cash position, which allows us to fund both organic growth in our businesses as well as to pursue inorganic growth opportunities that may arise. Thank you for your support, and I'll hand the call back over to Nate. Nate? Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, Laura, if you are still there, I think we can move to Q&A. We're at the end of our prepared comments. At this time, we will be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation form will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary for you to pick up your handset before pressing the star key. One moment while we pull for questions. Our first question comes from the line of Jeff Silver with BMO Capital Markets. You may proceed with your question. Thank you so much, and, and congrats on the strong finish and the momentum going into the current year. Um, you provided some color on you know demand trends and enrollment so far. You mentioned, I think, there's about eight weeks left in the enrollment season. Um, in a normal year, what percentage of your enrollments do you have by now, and do you think it'll be higher or lower than that this year? You know, Jeff, how are you doing? We anticipated right. that, <laughs> we anticipated that okay. everybody's question would be, how can you get at what the final enrollment number was going to be? And uh, I'm going to try to be disciplined and not give you that, because we don't know what it's going to be. And this year doesn't look like previous years, and, and we haven't disclosed what the weekly, monthly growth trends would be. So I don't want to be evasive. The bottom line is um, we gave this stat because we wanted to give people an understanding of where we are today. But I don't know how fast it's going to happen, and I don't know how this year is going to relate to the previous years. So we're going to decline to give more detail than just to say we're at 150 now. And uh, we know it's, it's continuing to grow. Um, you know, as you might imagine, we're seeing more demand this year than we've ever seen before, but I don't know how much that demand continues. I just wanted to give the, a little more color to investors than we've, than we've given in the past, but it's, it's just too hard to predict what's going to happen in this rest of this year. So I, I, I really can't try to contrast this year to previous years and, and go through that math. All right. You can't blame me for asking. Um, <laughs> no, let yeah. me ask you. I'll ask another question about the enrollment trends, and, and I'm not looking for a specific number, but the type of, of, of demand that you're getting, is it coming more uh, from parents? Is it coming more from your school district partnerships? Are you seeing an impact of some of the new schools that you're opening? Any color there would be helpful. Sure. And, and yes, we can answer that one. Um, it's coming, the primary growth is coming from parents who want to have an option for their kids. It's it's enrollment in our, our what we traditionally have called managed schools. Um, that's the primary growth. We are seeing increase, however, in school districts who call us and want to use our content and our curriculum. We have more of those contracts this year than we've ever had in any one year before. Um, I mentioned Miami-Dade, 
you know, there's others we're working on, not yet disclosed, but but maybe not as large as Miami Dade. I said there are 270,000 students. There are others that are literally anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 students. So we're seeing more demand there as well. But by far the biggest demand, they're individual parents saying, I need to get my kid into a into a, a, a safe environment. Um, and the new schools, um, the new schools that we're turning up are doing well. They're in smaller states, obviously. Um, they're not in the bigger states, but they're filling pretty fast. So we're filling those schools up kind of faster than we thought we would. Um, so they're all doing well as well. But but they're small. It's the new, it's the existing, Jeff, it's the existing states um, that you might imagine. It's the Floridas and Texases and Ohio's, you know, Michigan's, all of the big states in the country where we provide schools. That's what we're seeing the greatest amount of growth. All right, great. Let me sneak in one more, and then I'll jump back to the queue. So what do you say to those folks that think this might just be a one-year spike and, you know, hopefully we get a vaccine, and a year from now, schools are open as regular, and all those students will return to their old school? How will you grow post-pandemic? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Jeff. Um, and we, we think about that on a constant basis. We're actually focused as a team on what we can do in FY22 Right now, we've, we've had that conversation. As a matter of fact, we had a conversation about it earlier today. I'd say a couple things. There are five major factors to, to how we continue to grow. The first is retention. And I mentioned in my script that everybody in the organization knows we've got to provide a great experience for, our, for all these parents. They're going to come in and they're going to say, I thought I was going to one kind of program. We want to show them it's better than they thought it could be. That they're learning more. There's great flexibility in this program. They can do things that they couldn't have done in brick and mortar. Are we going to lose some when, whenever schools open back up? Absolutely. But will we lose them all? I don't think so. I think we've got a good program, and we're going to keep it. The second is socialization. That's number two. We have a number of programs that we are focused on so that when we have the opportunity, just like when regular schools have the opportunity to open up, we're going to have a number of socialization programs, some of which we are seeding now, but they're online, and then we'll have people in person. Um, interfacing with each other whenever COVID begins to subside. Third is galvanized growth. We will continue to see galvanized accelerate its growth in the consumer business. And by the way, once COVID subsides, while you might say the core business might lose some students, galvanized gets back to even higher growth because not only will they have online and remote, they'll now have the, the brick and mortar students back in. Um, fourth would be learning solutions. And learning solutions. Um, is growing again. It's getting market recognition. And what we're finding is that that the deals that we're doing and the people we're talking to are not doing it for one year. They're realizing this is an ongoing opportunity for them to include distance learning in their capabilities. And you've got to think about the backup programs that are necessary for hurricanes and snowstorms and, and sicknesses. Um, you know, all of those situations require having backup facilities. And they're all realizing online can do that. But the biggest one, yet of all my five, the single biggest one is the growth in career learning. Um, we have a lot of energy effort put into that. We're opening up more schools and uh, we think we're going to see continued growth in career learning at a higher rate than we've seen in the core business. So when you add improve, improvements and, and focus on retention, socialization, um, learning solutions growth, galvanized growth, and career learning growth, you see that we believe that we will not this is not just a one-time year. We're going to continue to grow. Does that help you? I really appreciate Yeah, I really did. Appreciate the call. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jeff. Our next question comes from the line of Stephen Sheldon with William Blair. You may proceed with your question. Hey, thanks. Uh, good to hear on the enrollment momentum. I was curious if there's anything notable about the grade levels where you're seeing higher enrollment growth. Are the enrollments skewing? kind of older or younger, and can you also talk about enrollment trends through August between career readiness and, and your traditional programs? Um, the percentage growth between the two is, is about equal. Um, we're not seeing one grow faster than the other um, one time. Um, but uh, in terms of, I'm sorry, the first part of your question was, Kind of get, so a breakdown, I guess, with the enrollment momentum between the age of students and then career readiness versus traditional. So yes, so uh, we, you know, it's kind of across the board. 
Um, we there's a slight difference um, in in the high school students and the product that they're going after. So we actually see a little more growth in in high school. Um, primarily, we have more of the of the high school, um, but generally we're seeing it across the board. I mean, I'm I'm not seeing a dramatic difference between high school students, middle school, and grade school. Um, I would say it's, it's across the board. Got it. Uh, and then on, on teacher hiring, I guess, how much progress do you, have you made on that front so far? How long does it take them to get up to speed? And how are you thinking about you know, teacher to student ratios in this environment? Um, teacher hiring is going well. <laughs> it's amazing how we, when you, when you need to hire more teachers, you go after them more aggressively. Uh, we also have, I don't know if you know this, but we have a part-time workforce that Learning Solutions grew upon whenever they needed to. We've engaged those teachers, and by the way, there, there are a couple thousand of them. We engage those part-time teachers to try to convince as many of them to come full-time for the year. We have gone to uh, colleges and universities to hire more from, from those sources. We've worked for uh, Teach for America to try to take uh, more of the graduates that are coming out of their, their program. Um, so teacher hiring is actually going pretty well. Make no mistake, though, we, you know, we still got a lot of hiring still to get done for the rest of the year. In terms of how fast they can get up to speed, our program has a standard set of training that we've honed over many years, and uh, it only takes them about two weeks to go through the training. The teaching techniques themselves, they already understand because they're experienced teachers. Um, what's happened is they have to learn our system, and they don't have to know all of the system the day they start. What they need to know is what's the beginning of the, of the content in the program. And as the students are learning throughout the year, the teachers are also getting more and more familiar with it. So we've got professional development sessions for all the new teachers, get them through the first week or a couple of weeks of training, and then we will continue that development all throughout the year. Got it. Um, and I guess just the last one for me, I think, I think Tim, you might have mentioned that there was in the this quarter – uh, some revenue from services uh, to the Georgia Cyber Academy. Did I hear that correctly? And if so, can you quantify that? Yeah, it was $4 million. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Congrats on the results and the momentum. Thank you. David. Our next question comes from the line of Greg Pendy with Sodity. You may proceed with your question. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, just if I... If I understand this correctly, in the commitment to break out uh, career learning, does that mean if, if we were to run through this quarter, the 116,700 students, break that out into 103,700, I guess, um, traditional uh, uh, general education, and then you'd have, say, 13,000 or so in the career learning, is that the commitment you guys will be reporting next year? So, so what you're asking, uh, uh, Greg, is you're saying, from our 122.3 thousand that we reported in first quarter of this year, 13.5 yeah, thousand yeah, yeah, were career learning students, and the remainder were general education. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're working out the uh, first. I was working out the fourth. Okay, that's that's fine. I I got it. Um, and then I guess just the next question. I mean, just going back to that article um, that you guys put out a while back on the teachers, uh, the 1300. Teacher hires. I mean, what is the general philosophy ahead of arguably uncertainty in terms of enrollment? Are you guys willing to spend ahead of growth, or are you going to be more prudent? Um, I guess even if the, even if some of the enroll uh, demand is there and, and pair back um, just from from your spend. I mean, how are you guys just big picture thinking about um, you know an arguably very big fall? Yeah, big from picture. From an expense standpoint. Yep, I got it. Big picture is this. Quality is more important. Um, we have to deliver a good service. So we're hiring teachers ahead of the demand. That means we take some financial risk. The fact is we may have more teachers than than the demand supplies, but so far we haven't been wrong. Demand is, demand is strong, so we try our best to hire ahead of it. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, that means there is some risk that we'll have more teachers than we need. I don't think that risk is high. I think it's a pretty low risk because all, for what we've seen in the, you know, the 150,000 number we reported today shows that the demand continues to grow, and we're not going to end up with, with too many teachers. We're going to end up with the right number. But philosophically, how to approach the problem, to answer your question directly, we try to hire ahead of demand. We're doing our best to get out in front of demand 
um, because the quality is just important. At the end of the day, if we have to have a couple million more in expense than we'd like to have, um, but what we did was we had the right set of teachers on board before the students got there, that to me is more important um, because the opposite means you're going to have bad academic results and, and, and uh, poor retention, and we just can't afford that. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I'm assuming teachers are the main the main um, hiring uh, risk that you're or uh, expense that you're looking into into the fall, correct? That's correct. And then and also okay. remember that the number is not just teachers; it's teachers and administrators. Now, the bulk of it is teachers, but there are some administrators in there, academic administrators and, and counselors and things like that that also get factored into the number. Okay, great. That's very helpful. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Greg. Our next question comes from the line of Alex Harris with Barrington Research. You may proceed with your question. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my uh, questions. Um, uh, congratulations on the strong finish of the year and what looks like uh, a, a great year coming up. Uh, so uh, just to, to pick on you a little bit, uh, what are you seeing in terms of, you know, from the states in which you operate in? Any telegraphing or signaling on what uh, school funding might look like in the coming year, uh, revenue per student, and that sort of thing. Obviously, uh, uh, there could be some pressure there, but again, do you have any anecdotal information that you're seeing operating in that space? Yes. And Alex, um, you said thanks for taking your question. You know, we always take your questions. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So, Yes, we are seeing some signals from, from states. Um, some states are struggling with the issue more than others. We think that, that on average, rates will, will not go up. You know, we're going to have a year when people are struggling with their economies, they're struggling with their taxes, and so we're not going to see rates go up. But we also know that, that every jurisdiction is struggling with, they don't want their kids to lose a year of growth. So, um, we're basically seeing most states saying, I'm, we're going to find a way to fund education. They're not backing off funding education. Now, you know, you might see small differences in the, in the 1%, 2% kind of change, but we're not seeing anybody say, hey, we're going to drop our rate um, and drop our reimbursement rate, you know, any significant number. We're not seeing anybody say that. We're not, we're not hearing that from states. They're all committed. They have to fund education and they have to find a way to get that done. In addition to that, CARES funding has really helped the state. The federal government has dropped a, a lot of funds into the states to help them, and um, many of the states are are counting on even more CARES funding to help them through the year. And then they've done some savings. You know, candidly, they uh, you know they they saved a little bit of money from some of the things they didn't spend money on. Um, you know, there are sports and there are buildings and things like that, and they're taking that money and they're putting that money into online. So uh, we're not seeing any dramatic uh, reduction uh, in rates. Although, you know, I, I want to be cautious, cautionary there. Um, we know that everybody's down on, on taxes because people, there are less people working and more people are on unemployment. So there's less revenues to the states, and the states are struggling with how do we solve this problem. But they're not backing off education to do it. So I don't know if I'm giving you enough color, but that's, that's how we see it. No, that's great and helpful. I appreciate it. Um, and then uh, I guess my last question is about uh, – Point that you made that you have over 150,000 students enrolled in managed public schools for the coming year. Um, is there uh, uh, what are the variables in terms of those enrollments starting, uh, and what is your historical experience there? <laughs> good, good try, Alex. <laughs> good try. Yeah. I, I'm not going to give numbers on it, but I'm, I'll give you a couple. And, okay. and I'll, I'll, tell you how we, I'll tell you how we think about it and how we're analyzing it, but the numbers, to be very honest with you, they're surprising us. Each time we look at the numbers, they're different than our, our previous year's trends. But we know that every year when, when parents um, enroll in our system, throughout that season, there is some percentage of them, relatively small percentage, who then decide they're not going to show up. So there's what we call a melt. Right? So there's X number. It'll be X minus number who actually show up. But it's a small percentage. 
At the same time, we also know that we get a lot of enrollments that happen through the end of the season, you know, especially as parents figure out whatever their other option wasn't available, I need to get into something. And lastly, we're seeing um, from all of our surveys, we're seeing a number of parents say, I don't know what my public school district is going to do. Um, I'm a little worried about that. And so we're seeing kind of an increased demand in the last few weeks as people worry about the health issues. Um, so while none of our trends look like the trends from previous years, we do look at all of these factors and we look at them quite honestly every day. We're tracking this, the, the numbers every day. And while I'm not going to give you the how did it do this year versus it did last year, I am going to tell you we monitor and, 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 and when I say we're going to be in strong double digits, um, that's based upon looking at the trends we've had in the past, the trends we're looking at today. We analyze this pretty closely. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be consistent here. I'm not going to disclose, you know, all of the specific trends. I'm just going to tell you we monitor those trends very closely, and we wouldn't make the statement we made if we weren't comfortable that uh, that you know that we've got a good handle on where the enrollments are, are coming out. That sounds uh, reasonable. I appreciate the uh, extra color. Thanks, guys, and good luck. Thank you, Alex. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. One moment while we pull for questions. Our next question comes from the line of Troy Adams Cribb. You may proceed with your question. Yeah. Hello? Hi, Troy. Hi. I'm in the education industry. And so I was just wondering um, what the similar question to before with the parents driving the demand, what percentage of your services are offered directly to the parents and what percentage are going through the, the actual public or private school system? Well, you know, in our public reporting, we do disclose um, how much of our revenues come from what we call managed schools and how much it comes from private schools, how much it comes from the institutional business. And so, um, you know, we, I don't know the, the percentage right off the top of my head, but some in, in the range of 85% comes from the, what we'll call the managed schools, the schools where we're offering, our schools are offering a service directly to consumers. Um, another maybe seven or 8% are coming from what we'll call the institutional. And then a slightly smaller percentage are coming from private schools. So that's generally sure. how I break out. Okay, thank you for the general, uh, Statistics. Okay. Thanks, Troy. Appreciate you being on the call. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of today's question and answer session. I would like to turn the call back over to Mr. Davis for closing remarks. Well, I want to thank everybody for listening to the call and, and staying with me as I had longer than normal comments today, but we had a lot to report on. Um, we obviously gave a little different stat than we normally do, but we, we thought it was important in this unprecedented time to give you some sense of where we are. Um, I appreciate everybody being on the call, and I hope everybody is safe and sound and uh, has a great rest of the week. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation. Have a great day.